The Prowl family had an autism episode I briefly touched on in a few videos, so let's just talk about it in the Prowl family as a whole. I myself am both black and autistic, and you hear pretty quickly when they're explicitly confirmed black autistic characters. But, uh, the Prowl family ain't it, cuz I'm sorry. I can't speak for all black autistic people, obviously, but I'll try and touch on some things I picked up on in watching the episode. I try not to be too hard on the original Prowl family from the early 2000s. It was one of the few and earliest black cartoons that existed at the time. There were not a lot of shows that featured a black girl as a protagonist, so while it certainly had issues of colorism and not sticking the landing with a lot of its executions, that doesn't invalidate the times it made genuinely positive moments and gave something of comfort and love for black viewers, especially black girls. I never got into it myself, but I recognize that it does hold a good place in the hearts of a lot of black viewers. I also specifically want to recognize that there was desire expressed to give a normalized portrayal of autism in black people with this episode. The Proud family doesn't hesitate to go there, as it doesn't shy away from real issues. But, to quote the war propagandist disguised as children's entertainment, G.I. Joe, Knowing is half the battle. The show seems merely content in just having brought up a topic, without any real consideration for what it's saying about those issues. The reboot has had decades of media development, and plenty it can learn from that it just doesn't. It not only repeats several mistakes from the original, but the ability to include and touch on new subjects introduces new issues. Oh, we're gonna talk about influencers on social media? Nah, let's turn this into a commentary about cancel culture as if it's a legitimate thing. You want to make this cancel culture episode feel ten times worse? Well, first, content warning for brief mention of sexual assault. Feel free to jump ahead to the timestamp if you don't want to hear that. Let's point out how seasons one and two of The Proud Family cast CeeLo Green to play a panda who made a brief appearance in the BB episode. You know, the same CeeLo Green who took to social media a while back to argue that people who really have been raped would remember it. He doesn't play a major role in the autism episode, but he does make appearances in others and was cast onto the show. But what is CeeLo Green doing here? Feel free to look up the charges against him. Vanessa Vu, girl, you looking like a snack to these hungry eyes. <laughs> Mr. Shuggy. I think there's something to be said about a show producing an episode about how cancel culture is a serious issue, while also casting a living example that contradicts that. That's not even getting into his homophobia. Good thing the Proud family isn't tackling- Oh, yeah. So we got a black gay man introduced in the reboot. Cool. Unfortunately, he contributes to the trope of black queer characters overwhelmingly getting booed up with white characters. And this one's a cop, which we all know is such a fitting character choice for a black queer man, and not at all a way to continue the idea of intentional othering of queerness as deviant and distancing from blackness by black cishet people and white queer people. The joke of Oscar dressing up when he sees there's another brother in the bank, though, was peak. That scene had me crying. All right, a brother. I got this loan. Gower, we got the power. The Proud family had a black girl protagonist, but it would also make several of the other girls, particularly Dijonet, colorist caricatures in relation to Penny. To understand the issues with the episode BB, we first also have to understand a more broad issue the Proud family has in its reliance on colorism. And I remember literally knowing that I was losing out to certain jobs because of my complexion. Colorism is in a lot of black media. Living Single, The Boondocks, Coming to America, My Wife and Kids, Blackish, literally anything coming from Chris Rock, you name it. Oscar and Dijonet are frequently used to espouse the wrong and harmful views the show then corrects. Of the main characters in the episode that discusses homophobia, it's the two of them that drive the conversation for causing the harm. That's not to say the others, including Penny, don't make their share of mistakes at times. In particular, La Cienega is a common Latina stereotype. This also manifests in how Oscar is almost always the target of abuse throughout most of the series. Dijonet is fat, loud, and dark-skinned, and the show frequently uses that in contrast to Penny, who is flawed but ultimately more sympathetic. And it uses that to portray fatness and being dark-skinned as disgusting and revolting. Hell, just the name Dijonet is already a mockery of black names. There's the exaggerated features in her lips, her hands, the way she's animated and posed to accentuate how abrasive she is. That's not to say that Dijonet is one-dimensional, as she's shown to be quite talented in a few instances, but it doesn't undo the larger use for her character and the history of doing this with dark-skinned black girls and women. It's a narrative we've seen time and time again in black media, one that mixes colorism and fatphobia at the expense of black girls. 
The show really tried to just laugh off Dijanae outing this black queer man to the whole neighborhood like she didn't just do something incredibly violent and dangerous. Maya, who was newly introduced in the reboot, also runs into this problem. She's an activist, but the writers honestly don't really have the range to write this kind of character. She contributes to another in the line of characters who ultimately stand for some kind of revolution, activism, or change, who are then revealed to be fake, elitist, and angry. So, there are moments where Maya is an awful friend, and one who needlessly condescends to the people around her. But it's important to think about not just the depiction, but also the framing, and how we're meant to think of her as a person, and intentionally portraying her that way. A lot of times these characters are also women, and run into two problems. One is that the writers need to know about the issues in depth to be able to accurately portray these kinds of characters. Second is that a lot of times, activist characters like Freddy from A Different World, Lisa Simpson, any teen sitcom girl ever, are often assigned to women and girls not to genuinely portray the issues, but as a character trait tied to frivolity, arrogance, or condescension. She's just rebelling against daddy, you know? She thinks she's so much better than everyone, but then she's frequently put in her place when she sees she's not as smart as she thinks she is, and it was wrong of her to go on her little moralistic crusade. That is she just never cared or understood in the first place. You hear that, viewer? Don't challenge the status quo, because you're only doing it for the wrong reasons and to feel better than everyone else. But what about Trudy, you might be thinking? There was that episode where she left Penny out on the streets and endangered her, and she's light-skinned in. Hollywood has a conflicting job for black women specifically, where they want to objectify women as much as possible, but that also conflicts with the priority of colorism toward them. As a result, colorism toward black women will often have an interplay with how desirable a woman is meant to be. They'll very often use dark-skinned women presented as unladylike, often compare them to beasts, portray their fatness, their textured hair, as undesirable and gross in a white gaze. It's used to impart the idea that the traits I just listed are revolting and a reason to deride these characters. Dark-skinned women will often be used in contrast to light-skinned women as undesirable, abrasive, or just angry. Light-skinned women can still be portrayed as angry or awful, but because they have light skin, often thin bodies and straight hair, they'll often be framed in a way that still assumes them more desirable than dark skinned women, but just wasting their good features. Everything else was so right, and by everything else I mean her looks, she was fine! So in talking about the framing for BB's autism, we also have to reckon with how the show utilizes colorism, and how it frames what it deems the right or wrong opinions. It's arguably even done with Bibi himself and Cece. Oscar, Maya, and Dijanae are all frequently awful people throughout the show, but we shouldn't leave it at just that. We should remember how the show uses that to direct the viewer on how they frame the conflicts. The show tries to go for a genuinely heartfelt moment, but like many things in the Proud family, there always has to be something that undermines the intent. What? What's wrong with my baby? I believe Bibi is showing signs of what we call autism. You calling my boy stupid? Off the jump, the Proud family falls into a trap a lot of shows do, which is blink and you'll miss it autism. Where we just say a character has autism once and we're done. In The Ghost and Molly McGee, fantastic show, we have Jun Chen who we're told is autistic, and that's pretty much it. Now, that's not to take away from the fact that we got autism representation for an Asian girl, but that's extremely minimal. You could just say any one of the McGee's is autistic, because there is not a damn neurotypical person to be found in this family. <laughs> While June having explicit autism rep is great, I think there's a much more resonant moment in this episode where Daryl doesn't understand why he does the silly pranks he does at school, that even by his own parents' admission, take a great deal of talent and creativity. He worries his family doesn't love him and how he's turned into a ghost while his mindless body gets praised for being well-behaved and doing everything right. Literally, every single scene and moment Molly has on screen will be a reasonable portrayal. Ain't no way this girl is neurotypical. Maya or KG both could have been reasonable choices if you actually want to commit to portraying black autism beyond checking a box. I'd lean a bit more toward Maya, simply because black autistic girls are extremely underrepresented. As much as I love the likes of Lunella and Donatello, two autistic coded characters, I think it's also valuable to have autistic characters who are not associated with science or technology, or are genius inventors. Portraying how autistic people often struggle in school, who don't fit in, and are not exceptionalized is all important too. I also think we should be careful on how we talk about or praise stories for having a character's identity be a normal, everyday thing in the story. 
That is important, don't get me wrong. And I think it's valuable not to feature socio-political issues in every portrayal. But I think there also needs to be something said about how often this is just used to rationalize sticking a character in the background, continually minimizing their presence and not committing to an actual portrayal. This can be very challenging because showrunners do face very real barriers, they face time constraints, so this isn't a blanket case across the board. Many showrunners have talked about these exact challenges, especially when it comes to things like queer portrayals. But unfortunately, I don't think that that was the root issue with the Proud family, for reasons I'll get into shortly. This really is not an episode about Bibi, and like many things autism related, we have to center everything entirely around the family members of the autistic person. Penny having all the labor and childcare thrown onto her is obviously bad, but it takes a different context in how that's used alongside Bibi's autism diagnosis, and how it's framed around relieving Penny of a burden and how the narrative sets Penny up to be as sympathetic as possible in that regard. Penny's parentification is a major issue throughout the series, but it does feel very intentional that one of the few times the show ever challenges the idea that it's okay is also in the episode where her brother is diagnosed with autism. Penny's friend group is also just trash once again. They see an unintended baby and y'all get mad at Penny and victim blame her, acting like she's overreacting when she's naturally upset at them for not helping an unattended child and being worried about his safety. I think they're doing a thing where BB has a positive sensory reaction is chasing the feeling of leaping off buildings, but that's also not an effective way to portray autistic traits or even educate non-autistic people on what they should know about autistic people. Do we want to talk about the trade-offs that come with BB having a formal autism diagnosis and the medical bigotry that comes with being a black disabled boy? What specific accommodations are they going for? On that note, let's shift gears a bit and talk casting. You see, Holly Robinson Pete provides the voice talent for the doctor, and if the credits are reliable, was also a consultant for this episode. However, from what I can find, a few sources have confirmed that she's a former board member of Autism Speaks, and I really take issue with a former Autism Speaks board member being a consultant and voice actor in an episode about autism. That knowledge also changes the context of a lot of the episode. Exactly what kind of school are they enrolling in that specializes in the needs of autistic children? A lot of the formalized resources pushed onto autistic children by many of the organizations held in power by neurotypical people act from a place of seeing autism as fundamentally harmful and something that needs to be corrected or eradicated, which makes it harder for me to see this as some kind of positive thing that they enrolled him in it. The episode is called BB, yet there's next to no focus on BB's thoughts on his autism, the school, or him as a person. Because they chose an infant to be the autistic character, BB is not able to communicate his feelings or perspective to the audience. It allows everyone else, most notably Holly Pete's character, to shape BB's narrative and center themselves in it. Now, there are non-verbal autistic people, and it can be a trait many of us have, so it's not as if it's unrealistic. But making your autistic character one who has little way to communicate their feelings to the audience, while mostly focusing on all their family members, instead isn't exactly a win. There's a difference between portraying a non-verbal autistic person and using an infant to minimize the autistic character's presence. We can only hear about Penny's thoughts of being burdened and caring for her siblings. We can only hear what Dr. Lord has to say about BB, what his parents think of the situation, but rarely the actual autistic person in the room. And that's honestly a microcosm of one of the biggest issues in addressing ableism not just toward autistic people, but toward the disability community as a whole. Able-bodied people will use disabled people as a proxy to act as if they themselves are oppressed for putting up with us. They target a group of people that they can either render unable to advocate for themselves, or pick a victim that cannot speak for themselves, like animals or infants. Now, babies in television can often still have ways of communicating with the audience, and we do see this to a small degree in how BB reacts during these tests. Baby Sinclair could talk despite being a baby who we still saw as such. Maggie Simpson has plenty of personality despite not speaking, those are just a few examples. But BB is not one of those cases and relegated to background status both before and after this moment. Imagine instead a scene where Trudy is feeding the babies. BB keeps refusing to eat where Cece has no problem, and Trudy complains that he's such a picky eater, only to learn about his autism diagnosis. And with this, you can have the doctor point out that he may be having a negative sensory reaction to the food. 
She makes a slight adjustment and sees how the way she labeled him Picky Eater already led her down the wrong path. There's still ways to have efficient storytelling in making autistic character an infant. The episode ends on a shot of all the children playing. As the door shuts, they're revealed to all be flying and have superpowers, alluding to the phrase, autism is a superpower, which it is not. Autism is a disability, and it's okay to call it that. Disability is not a dirty word. The episode even alludes to the fact that there are some autistic people with greater support needs. But even then, they still try to assure us that BB can live a normal life and is plenty intelligent. This plays into a lot of ableism that seeks to exceptionalize autistic people, where you're only viewed as a worthwhile person to keep around if you have talents or skills that can be exploited. This is what makes the savant trope so harmful, and why characterizing autistic people as super geniuses with no social skills, saying that autism is a superpower, and infantilizing us to that end is not a positive portrayal. More than anything, the Proud family louder and prouder conveys a great deal of arrogance to me. It continually brings up social issues and seems content in just having mentioned that they exist. It routinely doubles down on the exact mistakes it made in the original. I'd give it more grace if I felt it deserved it, but it communicates a lack of desire to change or improve, or even center the people it claims to give a voice to. We have several better options for depicting black girls. I wish I could speak more highly about it, but it is what it is. If you liked the video, consider the usual stuff of liking, commenting, and sharing to appease YouTube's merciless algorithm.